Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, good morning. We will be talking about chronic meningitis today. Uh, basically, we will be covering the lecture in the format of a case history followed by differential diagnosis of the cases, their laboratory diagnosis, then followed by special specific cases of chronic meningitis caused by cryptococcus, uh, newformans, tuberculosis, their diagnosis and the therapeutics recommended. Now, we had found had a case of a 35 year old man who was brought unconscious to us with complaints of fever, confusion, nausea and vomiting. He also had complaints of lethargy and irritability for the last few days. There was history of fatigue, malaise, low grade fever to start with since last 2 to 3 months. The symptoms became more serious over the period of time and lately he had been having headache all the time and was in a state of stupor. There was history of weight loss and night sweats. He was an old case of old uh, pulmonary tuberculosis being uh, on treatment but irregularly he had been on treatment. No history of TB or any chronic illness in any other family member in the um, uh, household. There was no history of any pets or any birds in contact, no history of genital ulcers. Query history of visiting, sex workers was there. On clinical examination, patient was a truck driver earlier and used to travel a lot. He looked emaciated and was semi-conscious and blabbering intermittently. No, there was no signs of neck stiffness or chronic sign. There were no signs of cranial palsies or focal neurological signs. He was found to have labored breathing though. And on clinical examination, we and physical examination was done, we took a blood culture sample and we cultured but which was negative for bacteria as well as fungi. X-ray chest was done which showed miliary consolidation. Cerebral imaging was done which showed hydrocephalus and basal meningeal enhancement was seen. Skin test for Tuberculosis, that is PPD skin test was done which was negative. HIV test was reactive. He was reactive to HIV, that is he was HIV positive. CD4 count was found to be around 100 per millimole. Lumbar puncture was done because the patient was having uh, irritability and mental stupor. He, uh, and it was seen that the CSF had an opening pressure of more than 25 centimeters of water. It was clear and colorless and it was sent for cytology and biochemistry reporting. It showed lymphocyte pleocytosis, low glucose levels in CSF, low CSF uh, to plasma glucose ratio and elevated protein levels. When the smear was made after centrifugation, a deposit was stained with zeal-nilsel stain, fluorescent stain, gram stain, India ink wet mount was done. We could not see any uh, organisms, lymphocytes were seen uh, in the uh, CSF though. CSF culture was done, liquid culture media that is mycobacterial growth indicator tube, Becton Dickinson and incubated for 42 days, growth detected in which the growth is detected by fluorescence microscopy from consumption of oxygen by mycobacteria, even that was negative. Sabrodextrose agar it was grown on, no growth after 4 days, it was incubated further. Blood agar also, no growth of any organism was seen. So we didn't know what was happening. Then what we did was, we did a CSF uh, and we looked for antigen for cryptococcus by latex agglutination test, even that was negative. So the patient was started on IV mannitol, uh, isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide and ethambutol along with ART treatment which was, uh, which was continued as it was, had been started earlier. There was no improvement and the patient kept worsening. He had seizures and increased pressure in the brain. Repeat CSF examination was done after two days. It was again negative for bacterial, fungal uh, organisms on microscopy as well as culture. Repeat cryptococcal antigen test now came positive, 1 is to 8 dilution. Patients were so suspected to have cryptococcal meningitis and was started on amphotericin B in combination with fluocytosin. The only thing that came positive was cryptococcal antigen test was positive, which is supposed to be a sensitive indicator of uh, infection of cryptococcus. Repeat test done after two days was also positive and it was higher dilution in which it came positive and was continued on the, the same treatment along with supportive treatment. The patient had to be 
of course the treatment has to continue for 6 months or more to see how it was. So what do we, we found this a different kind of uh, case from a case of acute meningitis that is why we thought of discussing it with you. Now meningitis as we all know is an inflammation or swelling of the protective membranes covering the brain and spinal cord. A bacterial or viral infection of the fluid surrounding medium, the brain and spinal cord usually causes the swelling. However, injuries, cancer, certain drugs and other types of infections can also cause meningitis. So it is important to know the specific causes of meningitis because the treatment differs depending on the cause. Now chronic meningitis is described when it is, it is diagnosed when a neurological syndrome has been existing for more than 4 weeks and it is also associated with the persistent inflammatory response in CSF with WBC more than 5 microliter. Also the patient might have headaches, infection uh, signs like fever, anorexia, nuclear rigidity, many forms involve the base of the brain and lead to cranial neuropalsies, may affect eye movements, facial musculature, seizures, patient might have mental status changes, confusion, hallucinations or he might have a focal neurological deficit, hydrocephalus or increased intracranial pressure. Etiologically, five categories of disease account for most cases of chronic meningitis which could be meningeal infections, malignancy, non-infectious inflammatory disorders, chemical meningitis or maybe paramenangeal infections. Amongst the infections, the important one which are can be should be considered for alternative diagnosis are, the list is a big one but it depends on age of the patient, immune status and also the geographical region from where the patient belongs to. It could be bacterial meningitis, acute bacterial which has gone on to chronic meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis, syphilitic meningitis, viral meningophilitis, cerebral malaria, cerebral toxoplasmosis, parasitic or eosinophilic meningitis, bacterial brain abscess due to SOL on the cerebral which is seen on cerebral imaging or there could be a malignancy example lymphoma. Now the common pathogens causing chronic meningitis amongst bacteria are mycobacterium tuberculosis or there could be treponema pallidum, in fungi, cryptococcus species, candida species, aspergillus species or coccidioides species could be causing chronic meningitis. Now, as far as the epidemiological history of these patients of chronic history, a chronic meningitis is concerned, usually they have a history of TB or exposure to a likely case, they might have traveled to Mediterranean region or, or might have ingested imported unpasteurized dairy products, one is uh, supposed to take history of time spent in wooded areas, especially endemic for Lyme disease and all, or past his uh, travel to areas endemic for fungal infection, exposure of the immunocompromised host to pigeons and other droppings exposure to STD, gardening, etc. All these histories are important to be taken in epidemiology. As far as the diagnostic hints are concerned which help you to diagnose the case, mostly there could be a which help you to focus on to where from where the infection is occurring in a patient. It could be a focal cerebral sign or a brain abscess or you could see an identification of potential sign source of infection like a chronic draining ear sinusitis, ear sinusitis, cardiac or pulmonary shunt or there could be recognition of and biopsy, one could do biopsy of unusual skin lesions if they are there which occur in cryptococcosis, blastomycosis, porotrichosis, pathosplenomegaly might be there which might suggest lymphoma, tuberculosis, brucellosis, sarcoidosis. There could be enlarged lymph nodes which again suggest chronic illness like a tuberculosis, lymphoma, etc. There could be ophthalmic uh, uh, examination might lead on to uveitis which might uh, help you to uh, think of a differential diagnosis. There could be maybe herpetic lesions or ulcer lesions in genital area which would suggest of HVC2 infection or there could be aptus oral ulcers, genital ulcers, other things which could be suggestive of a definite syndrome like Behaset syndrome. Once the clinical syndrome is set that is understood that which are the potential manifestations of chronic uh, meningitis, proper analysis of CSF is essential. See, first of all, if possibility of a raised intracranial pressure exists, a brain imaging study should be performed before doing lumbar biopsy. Contrast enhanced MRI or CT and, uh, studies of brain and spinal cord can identify meningeal enhancement, parameningeal infections, encasement of spinal cord or nodular deposits. So, imaging studies are useful to localize the areas of meningeal disease and to prior to the meningeal biopsy if suppose it is required. So what is done for lab diagnosis, usually first you measure the pressure of the CSF and then the CSF is collected, it is uh, stained, cell count is performed and you look for protein and glucose content, VDRL test is done, culture should be done on for bacterial fungal as well, 
serological test should be done and molecular test should be run. So, staining usually we do gram stain, India ink stain and wet mount. We are trying to look for bacteria, phasocytes and fungi all of them. Culture again we do for bacteria, fungi and also for mycobacterium tuberculosis. If mononuclear cells are there, usually they are predominant in CSF. So, if there are neutrophils which predominant after 3 weeks of illness, it could be suggestive of nocardia species or maybe blastomyces dermatitis, aspergillus or sporotrich species. Eosinophils, if they are predominant, they are suggestive of most probably some kind of parasitic infection or maybe T. pallidum infection. Lymphocytes, if they are predominant, would suggest of mycobacterium tuberculosis, pallidum, T. pallidum, aspergillus, cryptococcus species. So, all these could, they are indicators of which infection they could be. Fungal meningitis, when we talk about, it is usually acquired by inhalation of airborne fungal spores. Initially, a pulmonary infection occurs which may be asymptomatic. Pulmonary infection usually is often self-limited, so the patients many times are not detected during this period. Fungal meningitis is not so common, it is rare and usually caused by fungus spreading through blood to the spinal cord. Although anyone can get fungal meningitis, but people with weakened immune system like those with HIV infection or cancer or are at increased risk. And usually it is not spread from person to person. Etiopathogenesis of fungal infection or fungal meningitis, how does it occur? Usually what happens is whenever an environment is disturbed with a lot of fungal spores, the fungal spores are there in the air around you and it is, they are inhaled, go to lungs, finally go to spinal cord and to the causing to meningitis. Cryptococcus pneumoformans, most common causes found worldwide in soil and bird excreta associated with immunodeficiency states. Histoplasma capsulatum usually is seen in endemic areas. Coxidiodism imitase is also seen in endemic areas of Southeast US, Mexico and Argentina. Candida is usually acquired in a hospital setting where patient has had antibiotics, some signs of surgery and is immunodeficient. Also associated with immunodeficient uh, disseminated disease and lung infection. In case he is having, he will have meningitis only if he is associated also having a disseminated disease alongside there. So, lab diagnosis of fungal meningitis usually one do one does cytology that is you look for um, characteristic CSF abnormalities which kind of uh, cells you see immunonuclear cells which you see increased protein concentration is there, decreased glucose concentration is there. You might see eosinophils in cases of coccidiodus uh, infection. Then you do microscopy to look for the which fungus or uh, bacteria you see and you further try and do culture. Now, cryptococcosis is an acute, subacute, uh, systemic or meningeal mycosis. It could present in any of these forms that is acute form, subacute form or you know a chronic form. It is usually caused by the inhalation of spores and or desiccated yeast cells of cryptococcus pneumoformans. The yeast has a natural habitat in the soil with an alkaline pH and it which uh, soil which is uh, alkaline and rich in nitrogen. Optimally achieved in soil mixed with the excreta of turkeys, pigeons, birds, etc., and decaying wood, tree hollows also you could find them. Four serotypes are there A, B, C, D, but type A and D are the most infectious. Now, these infections are extremely rare in people who are otherwise healthy. Most cases of cryptococcus infection occur in people who have weakened immune response, particularly those with advanced AIDS or HIV infection. It is the initial AIDS defining illness in approximately 2% patients and generally occurs in patients with CD4 count less than 100 per uh, microliter. Before the AIDS era, cryptococcus was a well recognized but rare disease. But now it is, has been increasingly seen in HIV infected patients. Mode of infection is either through inhalation or through skin uh, inhalation or through skin or mucosa. Lungs is the primary site of infection and CNS disease is the most frequent disease which we see because and at the time when the lungs is getting infected it is mostly not recognized. So, pathogenesis as far as the pathogenic infection is concerned, cryptococcal infection will depend on the virulence of the yeast and also the immune status of the patient. Accordingly, the patient will present with the illness as to what form of illness and how severe the illness is there. Either he has no infection, so it is cleared, that is the infection is cleared or he might have a latent infection or he might have a symptomatic disease. So, in symptomatic disease, he could have a pulmonary infection or which could disseminate to other parts of the body that is typically the CNS which might include meningoencephalitis and symptoms might include fever, headache, lethargy and mental status changes. So, clinically a patient might present when he has pulmonary infection 
that is the time it enters the body through the respiratory tract. But the usually at this time it is mild infection, self limiting and no calcifications usually are seen. So, it is a transitory and mild character of infection may be missed in the absence of symptoms and radiological shadows. Infection can present like pneumonia or it might present like a pneumonia like illness with symptoms such as cough, fever, chest pain and weight loss. Acquisition of the disease usually occurs in early in life and which can get reactivated at a later time in immunocompromised hosts. Clinical and radiological presentations are non-specific and more severe, they will be more severe in immunocompromised hosts. CNS disease on the other hand is the most frequent form of cryptococcosis. It can present as meningitis, meningoencephalitis or cryptococoma. Cryptococcal meningitis is the most common clinical form, it presents in 85 percent cases. Commonly seen in patients with abnormalities of T lymphocyte function and they occur in around 10 percent of AIDS patients. Clinical signs are rarely dramatic, that is the patients have symptoms which develop slowly over the years, over several months which could include headache, followed by drowsiness, dizziness, irritability, all these are all the symptoms that he might have in 65 to 90 percent of cases or he might have confusion in another 30 percent cases or some patients might present with nausea and vomiting, others could present with neck, neck stiffness and focal neurological deficits which could maybe hint at a meningeal infection. Or he might have lesions of skin, mucosa, viscera and bones which are again not suggestive of meningitis but later he could go on to meningitis. Sometimes his infection is resembles a disseminated form of tuberculosis. It could be like a miliary tuberculosis, again it becomes difficult to diagnose. So, risk factors as far as cryptococcal infection are concerned, usually it is they are rare in patients who are healthy. So, the most common, uh, most cases of cryptococcus occur in patients with weakened immune systems such as people who have advanced HIV or AIDS, who have tra organ transplantation done, are on track corticosteroids or medications to treat rheumatoid arthritis or other infections which are the which lead on to weakening the immune system. As far as laboratory diagnosis is concerned, one has to collect the mat material which would be most specific for diagnosis like in the case of meningitis, CSF is the sample which is most single most useful diagnostic test which needs to be done that is CSF the lumbar puncture needs to be done to collect CSF or you could have a biopsy of a tissue depending if a patient is post mortem or one could get sputum and bronchial washings then one could get past blood or urine can be collected depending on the site of infection or the organ system which is involved. Direct microscopy is done unstained wet preparation of CSF is seen with India ink or negrosin and you see unstained uh, rounded yeast cells which have got which are not stained and there are these capsules which are unstained which are seen in the dark ink staining that has been done. Tissue sections uh, you could get which are stained by pass or uh, other stains, pass staining and mucicamine stain which specially stains the capsule. So, pink capsule is stained in mucicamine stain or you could do silver staining and then you could see these black round budding yeast cells. Capsulated cells usually they are big size 4 to 20 micron inside uh, and they have a mucopolysaccharide capsule around them. But basically microscopy has limited sensitivity and one needs to collect large volumes of CSF required for India ink smear or grow, growing the organism and culture. So, you could do India uh, uh, um, silver staining by which black colored stains are uh, uh, yeast are seen or you could do a pass staining where a yeast with a capsule is seen. So, different stainings can be attempted to look at the and this is a very diagnostic test for a tissue biopsy if you get and you can demonstrate the presence of cryptococcus or you need to do culture, culture is the gold standard for diagnosing cryptococcal infection, you do culture usually on sabrodextrous agar or blood agar and smooth mucoid cream colored colonies are got within 2 or 3 days, they are not difficult to grow, growth at but to diagnose uh, cryptococcus neoformans one should look for growth at 37 degrees centigrade, then one can uh, on niger seed agar they produce brown uh, colonies due to the uh, pigmented melanized uh, uh, yeast colonies which are there. They usually lack fermentative uh, ability, but they can hydrolyze urea. So, on the basis of which they are diagnosed. On microscopy from the colony, you will see uh, dark colored yeast cells which are budding uh, on from the colony. You could also do cryptococcal polysaccharide antigen test. Antigen detection can be used. Uh, you can do it in CSF, you can do it in serum and this is for detection of early asymptomatic cryptococcal infection, especially in HIV infected divisions. It is a highly sensitive and a specific test, higher it has more sensitivity than microscopic culture, 
different you can do by latex agglutination, you can do by enzyme amino assay or by lateral flow assay. All these tests are available. Further for other fungal meningitis, suppose you are not getting this, you would look for detection of histoplasma polysaccharide antigen in CSF which establishes the diagnosis of fungal meningitis due to H capsulatum, but may be false positive also in coxidiodal meningitis also. For coxidiodal meningitis, one needs to look for uh, complement fixation antibody test is done which has a specificity of 100 percent and sensitivity of 75 percent for diagnosis. Treatment of chronic meningitis due to for in these cases, people who have cryptococcal infection need to take prescribed antifungal medication for at least 6 months or even longer. The type of treatment will depend on the severity of the infection and the parts of the body that are affected. For people who have asymptomatic infection, example diagnosed by a targeted screening or mild to moderate pulmonary infections only, the treatment is usually fluconazole alone. For people who have severe lung infections or infections in the CNS, brain and spinal cord, the recommended treatment is amphotericin B in combination with flucytosin followed by fluco uh, fluconazole for an extended time to clear the infection. Some people may need surgery to remove the fungal growth that is the cryptococcomas. So as far as treatment is concerned in non-HIV, non-transplant patients, induction therapy start with is amphotericin B and flucytosin followed by uh, consolidation therapy of fluconazole. Organ transplant recipients you will treat with liposomal amphotericin B or amphotericin B lipid complex along with flucytosin. Patients with HIV infection are again treated with the similar thing lipid form of amphotericin B, flucytosin and finally indefinite maintenance therapy with fluconazole. If an infection is due to H capsulatum, it is again treated with amphotericin B and the maintenance therapy is with itraconazole. While a case of coxidiodus imitis is treated with higher dose of fluconazole as monotherapy or intravenous amphotericin B. What is now, there is a concept known as targeted screening which is done for cryptococcal infections and this is done because cryptococcal neoformance is able to live in body uh, undetected for long period of time and, the pay, and it can you know uh, present in a very florid pattern when the patient's immune system is uh, decreased due to any reason. So a simple blood test to detect cryptococcal antigen which is an indicator of cryptococcal infection in HIV infected patients before they begin antiretroviral treatment is done and this is known as targeted screening. A patient who tests for positive for cryptococcal antigen can take fluconazole and antifungal medication to fight off the silent fungal infection and prevent it from developing into a life threatening infection. So a silent asymptomatic patient if he is found to have CSA, uh, uh, on a serum testing antigen positive, he can be started on fluconazole and can be prevented to, from going to a more serious form of uh, cryptococcal infection. Then, uh, mycobacteria is another cause which is a very common cause of chronic meningitis and this is usually due to infection with mycobacterium tuberculosis which is acquired by inhalation of aerosolized droplet nuclei. Primary infection can lead on to miliary tubercles in brain parenchyma during hematogenous dissemination of the bacilli. These tubercles can enlarge and can also be caseating. Etiology usually is a propensity of a casual lesion to produce meningitis will depend on its proximity to the subarachnoid space and it can rate at which the fibrous encapsulation develops. Subependymal caseous foci can cause meningitis by a discharge of bacilli and tuberculosis antigens into the subarachnoid space. Clinically, the patient TBM presentation is no different from other meningitis. Unusually, one may have a chronic headache for many months, mental change, isolated confusion. There could be in young children poor feeding, growth and malaise, unexplained fever, cranial nerve palsies, unexplained seizures. So the clinical features will be predictive for chronic meningitis mainly will be a history of more than 6 days and evidence of TB of at any other site. Complications of TB meningitis are significant and in some cases life threatening. So one really needs to be careful. One can get seizures, hearing loss, increased pressure in the brain, brain damage, stroke, one can go on to death. And there can be permanent increased pressure, especially in the brain, can cause permanent and irreversible brain damage. So, one needs to detect early and start treatment early. In addition to CSF examination, pertinent underlying illnesses need to be uncovered. So, basically, one test, one does uh, tuberculin test, which is a skin intradermal test, which is done and read after 48 hours. You look for the uh, induration and the, uh, the size of the induration. 
Then there is chest radiograph or chest CT can be done to look for pulmonary lesions, which is the most common presentation of a tuberculosis in uh, most cases. You can look, do urine analysis and culture or blood count and differential count also might help you to know whether a patient has tuberculosis or not. Further lab investigations which need to be done are renal and liver function tests, alkaline phosphatase, sedimentation rate, anti-nuclear antibody, anti-RO or anti-LA antibody, serum angiotensin converting enzyme level or one could do liver or brain biopsy, or bone marrow biopsy to in case of miliary tuberculosis you might get uh, to differentiate from sarcoidosis or other malignancies and other. So, a biopsy can be stained and you can look for you know um, granuloma along with maybe AFB bacilli or you know giant cell granuloma which could be seen. Lab diagnosis of TBM is diagnostic clinical you know main is you will suspect TBM when there are diagnostic clinical features like neck stiffness, confusion, coma, cranial nerve paralysis, sixth, third and fourth might be involved, focal neurological signs like monoplegia, hemiplegia, paraplegia or patient might have urinary infection and urinary retention. CSF when it is uh, seen, CSF profile would be high opening pressure of more than 25 centimeter water in 50 percent cases, usually clear and colorless, raised white cell count with neutrophils and lymphocytes and raised protein CSF to plasma glucose ratio which is seen in 95 percent cases. If you do microscopy, AFB smear, CSF sample that is taken, 10 ml centrifuge and the deposit is stained with ZN, ZN stain or fluorescent stain and looked under light of fluorescent microscopy. Mycobacteria appear as red, slender, bent, beaded rods, 2 to 4 micrometer in length and they are 0.2 to 0.5 micrometer wide. They are universally available, this smear can be done, it is a quick and inexpensive test. Usually the last tube of the LP is the one which is most uh, pertinent for doing this test. Despite being developed over hundreds years ago, the acid smear, uh, acid fast smear still remains the most commonly used test for diagnosis of tuberculosis. But an estimated 10,000 organisms are required for a smear to be positive, resulting in poor sensitivity of the test, particularly in bacillary disease. Positive smears are reported in 10 to 40 percent TB meningitis in adults. Microscopy has low sensitivity in routine diagnostic laboratories. So, the sensitivity can be improved by increasing trying to have more CSF volumes, serial samples if they are collected, right on pretreatment if it is done or by fluorescence microscopy we can increase its sensitivity. Fluorescence microscopy if it is done by oramin rhodamine staining it is more sensitive, it has a higher thoroughput than light microscopy and the equipment and the bulbs are, but the equipment and the bulbs are more expensive so one has to look at that. Light emitting di uh, dioid LED fluorescent microscopy is what has overcome many of these issues and is now recommended by WHO. Culture is a gold standard. Culture of CSF can take up to 4 to 8 weeks to identify the organism and usually the medium employed is the LJ medium which is the Lowenstein Jensen medium which is used and the culture is positive in our, say around 50 percent of adults but you need to culture a large volume more than 5 ml of CSF. Microscopic another thing which could be done culture could be done by MODS method that is a microscopic observation drug susceptibility assay which is a liquid culture assay that uses middle brook 7H9 broth culture and an inverted microscope to detect the mycobacterial growth. The technique evaluated in a number of studies is found to be useful for diagnosis of tuberculosis and detection of drug resistance. It has been evaluated for diagnosis of TBM and is found to be more sensitive than CSF smear and more rapid than conventional TB culture with a medium time positivity of being 6 days. But it is available only at reference levels and rather than district peripheral levels and requires containment level 3 facilities for its usage. Molecular tests can be done which are very uh, upcoming and which are can detect very fast. They can detect fewer than 10 microorganisms uh, in a clinical specimen. PCR is the most common methodology used, real time PCR, isothermal. Uh, PCR, strain displacement or transcription mediated amplification, ligase chain reaction, any of these have, all most of these have been tried to look for tuberculosis bacilli. Specificity of NAT is high but sensitivity is low, variable. Sensitivity is highest in smear positive samples, respiratory sample, lower in smear negative and non-respiratory samples. Negative result by NAT does not rule out tuberculosis in these situations, so you need to look at other things. Line probe assays can be done, DNA which is a DNA strip test that can detect M tuberculosis and most common any genetic mutations which could be conferring any resistance to certain uh, anti tubercular treatment. 
It has an ability to detect M tuberculosis and drug resistance in sputum specimens or cultured isolates, but it is an expensive uh, test, requires a containment level 3 laboratory and laboratory expertise including PCR, have been formally endorsed by WHO and are now in routine use in middle and high income countries though, but they are expensive. Two LPAs are available, Inno and Lipa RIF TB uh, and genotype ND uh, BDTR plus which is available from Germany and they are currently available for detection of M tuberculosis in clinical specimens and culture isolates. Gene Expert is an automated cartridge based system for sputum processing, DNA extraction and amplification. It is used for detection of M tuberculosis and rifampicin resistance. It has an ability to detect M tuberculosis and drug resistance in sputum and other clinical specimens. In sputum spear positive cases, studies have reported sensitivity of 93 to 98 percent specificity of 83 to 99 percent. This can be used in a district level laboratory, but the disadvantages are that they are expensive and high false positivity rate in areas with low prevalence of rifampicin resistance. Interferon gamma release assays can be done, which are whole blood tests that detect immune response to a panel of M tuberculosis antigens. They are used for diagnosis of latent tuberculosis, but have a limited value in diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis. The results are available within 24 hours, but not affected by BCG vaccination and usually, but these tests are not recommended for diagnosis of active tuberculosis disease. Disadvantages, they require large volumes of CSF for diagnosis of TABM. Sensitivity is variable and also a high rate of indeterminate results are there. So, they are not recommended usually for diagnosis of active tuberculosis. One could look for some antigen. Antigen detection could be done. There are antigens like lipo, um, and an LAM antigen in urine, which is a point of cure test, which is, can be done at community level. Currently, it is being validated for diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis, but no data are available in TBM patients. Two recent studies are, however, looking at them in CSF. One could look for detection of antibodies to M tuberculosis or its antigens within CSF, which looks promising in preliminary studies, but have failed to translate into routine care settings. Two recent tests using PCR and LISA have reported high sensitivity and specificity, though. Other biomarkers you could look for, which uh, because of the low sensitivity of standard diagnostic tests, attempts have been made to look for biomarkers. They could be CSF lactate levels, which can be used as a diagnostic marker for CNS infections. Lactate especially is produced by bacterial anaerobic uh, metabolism, so increased levels would suggest a bacterial meningitis and maybe tuberculosis. Clinical experience in Vietnam suggests that CSF lactate levels of 5 to 10 millimole uh, per liter support a diagnosis of TBM and that high levels are associated with death. However, this marker has not been validated as a diagnostic test. It is a potential novel diagnostic test though. You could also look for study which has identified ALOX5 as a potential biomarker, but there are studies going on this and these are not validated tests which to be used for diagnosis. One can also look for adenosine DMINS activity, ADA activity, which is a rapid test that can be used for diagnosis of pleural, peritoneal or pericardial forms of tuberculosis but it cannot distinguish between bacterial and TBM uh, cases and using ranges of ADA levels one can uh, use it to prove, imp you know, improve TBM diagnosis but one cannot be too sure because you cannot differentiate from bacterial meningitis. Now when you look at uh, TBM in pa uh, patients who have uh, with HIV and without HIV, there is the, the certain, you know, parameters which can help you to differentiate. In, as far as duration of symptoms is there, they, in most cases there is nearly the similar duration of symptoms, similar signs, but in HIV patients there might be higher frequency of signs outside CNS while in HIV uninfected there could be more cognitive disinfection which is seen. Lymphocytosis is seen in HIV uninfected cases more often while there might be a predominant neutrophil predominance in HIV infected cases. In HIV uninfected cases, protein is higher compared to the infected ones. Glucose level is low in nearly both the cases, but it may be less low in HIV infected cases. And hydrocephalus is used to uh, is seen to be more often present in HIV non-infected cases compared to HIV infected cases. Less frequently present compared to the infected cases. Usually, the diagnostic methods for TBM usually are produced are done by these methods, and their yields are like this. Microscopy gives you around 5 percent positivity, uh, clinical prediction might give you a 50 percent positivity, culture you might get 20 percent positivity, PCR, gene expert and all can be done 
up to 80 percent if 3 ml of CSF and centrifuge testers are used, but usually 50 to 60 percent positivity. You can do antigen antibody tests, but they are unreliable. Cytokine assays, interferon, interferon gamma assays have been giving positivity to 90 percent and there can be interferon gamma immune response which can be seen, which can be or you can look for interferon levels which can help you for diagnosis. Rapid diagnosis is usually done by different factors. There are clinical factors more than or less uh, 6 score is what is considered to be 31 percent sensitive, 94 percent specific. Clinical score plus clinical suspicion. Microscopy in ensure adequate volumes of CSF, centrifugation, adequate time for examination uh, slide, it increases the diagnosis. PCR is expert after centrifugation again, expert if it is done using at least 3 ml of CSF is again a better test or nested PCR can be tried. One can do uh, this PCR can be 98 percent specific and 56 percent sensitive. Immune based tests are there like I told you earlier, they have different sensitivity IGRA test or interferon gamma levels in CSF or the LAM antigen test which can again have a varied level of sensitivity and specificity. So, the clinical score in TBM, how is it done? Diagnostic score maximum category score is 6 which is taken and this is depending on different symptomatology that is there and different scoring is given. If a patient has symptoms and signs of meningitis, headache, vomiting, neck stiffness, fever, seizures, focal neurological level, he can get a score of 1. Altered consciousness 1, cranial nerve palsy is 1, malaise history of more than 5 days he can get a score of 4, night sweats he can get a score of 2, weight loss 2, cough for more than 2 weeks 2, history of close contact with uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis in children less than 10 years again a score of 2. So, all these when added together. If they add on to a, a score of 6, it, is, it can be very well predictive of tuberculosis meningitis. Clinical criteria, other which are useful are the CSF criteria, which is the maximum category score of 4. Clear appearance is 1, CLs 10 to 500 per microliter is 1, lymphocytic predominance is 1, protein concentration greater than 1 gram per liter is 1, CSF to plasma glucose ratio of less than 50 percent or an absolute CSF glucose level of concentration less than this, you can get a score of 1. So, again a scoring can be done on CSF criteria. Then imaging criteria have another scoring can be done depending on hydrocephalus, meningeal enhancement, tubercloma, infarct, basal hyperdensity, you have seen different scores can be given. Evidence of tuberculosis elsewhere, that is another method of giving score, again a maximum category score of 4 can be given. If a chest radiograph suggests of active tuberculosis, signs of tuberculosis are seen, a score can be given. CT, MRI, ultrasound evidence for tuberculosis, another score can be given. AFB identified from culture from another source other than sputum and all, a score can be given. Positive commercial test by NAT from extra neural spe specimen, another score can be given. So, all these together scores together can help us to diagnose tuberculosis, TBM very fast. A definite tuberculosis meningitis would be a clinical criteria with demonstration of M tuberculosis in the CSF by culture, microscopy or PCR. Probable tuberculosis meningitis would require a score of 12 or more. There can be clinical criteria where CSF changes, which could be any of these. There could be imaging changes. There could be evidence of tuberculosis elsewhere in the body. Possible tuberculosis meningitis is clinical criteria as defined along with diagnostic score of 6 to 9 points without CNS imaging or 6 to 11 points with CNS imaging. Not TBM, that is, is known, not considered to be if there is a demonstration of alternate diagnosis. So, these are the different ways by which TBM is being uh, diagnosed depending on the scoring. As far as treatment is concerned, tuberculosis meningitis, empirical therapy is initiated on basis of high index of suspicion. Initial therapy is a combination of isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and pyridoxin. Treatment gives a good clinical response with the isoniazid and rifampicin continued alone for 6 to 12 months. 6 month course of uh, therapy is acceptable but should be prolonged to 9 to 12 months in patients with adequate resolution of meningitis symptoms or positive mycobacterial cultures of CSF. Dexamethasone therapy for HIV negative patients can also be given with tuberculosis meningitis. So, basically a management of TB patients would, consult, would have to look at drug interactions which can be there. One has to manage com complications like paraplegia, stroke, etc. There could be dehydration and all which has to be managed. Finally, one has to look at the development of drug resistance and you should be on the lookout for drug resistance organisms. MDR TBM very little uh, on TBM has very little literature which is available. 
include first line drugs to which organism is sensitive that is but you can add injectable for at least 6 months, quinolone or moxifloxacin sometimes needs to be given, role of linezolid, prothenomide and, and other things are uncertain but one has to look at all these things for the long term treatment of these cases. As far as the case of syphilitic meningitis is concerned, usually it is seen in patients who have syphilis which is an STD disease maintained by appearance of painless chancre at inoculation site. T pallidum invades CNS early in the course of illness and therefore cranial nerves which is 7 and 8 are most frequently seen to be involved. Lab diagnosis of syphilitic meningitis would include a reactive serum treponemal test or fluorescent treponemal antibody test, FTABS or micro hemagglutination test that is T pallidum hemagglutination test is associated with a CSF lymphocytic or mononuclear pleocytosis and an elevated protein level. Also CSF VDRL is uh, positive in these cases, a negative CSF FTABS or MHATP rules out neurosyphilis. So these tests need to be done. Treatment is done usually with aqueous penicillin G intravenously every 4 hours or, pro or procaine penicillin G intramuscularly daily for 10 to 14 days. Either regimen followed by benzathine penicillin G, IM once a week for 3 weeks and CSM should be re-examined at 6 months intervals for over a period of 2 years. So as far as cases of chronic meningitis is concerned, a list of diagnostic tests if you can you know as a um, summary, in m tuberculosis usually it is the culture, AFB culture or staining which can demonstrate the tuberculosis bacilli, AFB staining or PCR which are most relied on, T pallidum, CSA VDRL, serum VDRL and FTA and AMHA, uh, TP, trypnoma pallidum test which are relied on, Aspergillus species, the culture would be most significant, Candida species if it is causing infection again a staining and a culture of the CSF, Poxidido species you look for antibody detection in CSF, Cryptococcus you will do an India ink or wet mount microscopy, blood and urine for antigen and also for culture antigen detection in CSF or cultures which are needed for diagnosis of these cases. So I think this is about all, but if overall a treatment of chronic meningitis is concerned where you are not able to exactly know as to what the disease is due to and empirical therapy must be initiated till a diagnosis is made when all attempts at diagnosis fail. Empirical therapy in United States consists of antimicrobacterial agents that is amphotericin and amphotericin for fungal infection, glucocorticoids for non-infectious uh, inflammatory causes. Treatment will include INH, uh, rivampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide should be given uh, for against M tuberculosis, IV or orally, penicillin G given for against T pallidum, IV, amphotericin B plus flu cytosin for cryptococcus infection, IV or orally, fluconazole given against cryptococcidiodus species orally. So, the, it is important to direct empirical therapy of lymphocytic meningitis at tuberculosis, particularly if the condition is associated with hyperglycorrhizia, uh, sixth and other cranial palsies, since untreated disease is fatal in 4 to 8 weeks. So these are the empirical treatments which are followed till a diagnosis is made, but diagnosis is most important to be made of these organisms, utmost care and utmost uh, facility should be there to be look at to be able to diagnose so that because the complications and uh, morbidity of these patients is very high. So thank you for uh, giving the patient listening to this lecture on chronic meningitis. Thank you.